evening, everybody. So tonight we're going to be talking about uh, Majima Nikaya number nine, Right View. Although this sutta is titled Right View, it's, we're really going to be mostly talking about dependent origination. And it will be going over uh, each step of dependent origination in some detail. So dependent origination is a uh, core of the Buddhist teachings. Uh, it describes an uh, impersonal process of cognition, how our sensory experience works, our cognitive processing works going to behavior. It's commonly taught in a 12 step format. Um, it's also taught in a nine and 10 step or six step and 24 uh, step uh, presentations. I have talked about it every talk uh, that we've done so far. And when I do, it's usually in the stick, six step uh, formation like that. It's something worth learning with time, uh, how this works. It said, um, one who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma and one who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. And it's also said, uh, one who sees dependent origination knows the three characteristics, though not everyone who sees the three characteristics knows dependent origination. So it's, a, it's an important, uh, important thing to understand. It's a lens which we can interpret and process our experience. Um, it's taught in several different time frames. When we have a lens like this, uh, we can find it in, in many different ways. So if you imagine a spiral or a circle and you take that pattern and then you look for it in the natural world, well, you're going to find it on the level of galaxies, cloud formations, trees in our uh, cells. You're going to find it as you make sense of your world everywhere. It's a pattern like that. Dependent origination is like that as well. So some people, you can discuss it on a three lifetime time frame. We're not going to talk about that tonight. That's not really applicable to your meditation practice uh, immediately, though that's maybe interesting to hear about. Then there's the microscopic time frame uh, presentation. This is more relevant and can be directly perceived, though it, uh, one needs to have a really refined consciousness to do that. And, and so it's, it's good to know about it. You get a, you get a sense of this, for those of you in infinite consciousness that start seeing the rising and passing away of consciousness very, very fast. This is on the mind moment scale, which is really unbelievably fast. Um, we're talking probably quantum levels of experience there. So hundreds of thousands of, of events in less than a second kind of time frame. A more useful time frame is something on seconds to minutes, uh, more and less. And that's how we're going to be talking about it today. So as you learn about this, you can learn to watch it, watch for the steps in your daily life. Um, Knowing how what one or two steps is and identifying it, you can watch as, as it occurs uh, all the time. This will help you sharpen your mindfulness, and it's a reminder uh, to not take what is happening personally. And relax, smile, and uh, bring your object of meditation to the present moment. So the, the 12 steps starts with ignorance. Uh, ignorance refers to not understanding the Four Noble Truths or not seeing them, uh, not being mindful. Uh, with ignorance as condition, formations arise. Formations are uh, a comma, they're a volition. Um, comma is basically volition, intention. Uh, these can arise uh, based on conditions. Based on formation, consciousness arises. 
consciousnesses are of the six sense bases. So we have eye consciousness, ear consciousness, mind consciousness, and so on. Based on consciousness, mentality, materiality. Mentality, materiality, um, nama rupa. This can be, uh, this is basically form and how we perceive form, the body mind complex. So, uh, rupa, form, consists of the four elements um, earth, water, fire, and air. We perceive these as solidity, uh, cohesion, heat or cold, and movement or vibration. And then the faculties that can perceive the elements, um, attention, contact, uh, volition, feeling, and perception. So with these uh, as condition, uh, the, the sense bases arise. Eye, eye and sight, ear and sounds, mind and mind and objects, and so on. Based on mind objects, uh, as condition, we have contact. And contact is the combination of the sense bases and consciousness. So uh, when eye informs and eye consciousness uh, meet, we have eye contact. Based on contact, we have feeling, eye feeling. Feeling and perception uh, are, happen conjoined. So feeling in and of itself is a pleasant feeling unpleasant feeling, a neutral feeling, and then it can be the knowledge of what it is we are feeling. So a pleasant image of a flower. Uh, with feeling as condition, craving. So craving is the beginning of identification. So uh, I like it, I don't like it, I am that. This is the beginning of taking things personally and potentially the beginning of starting to try to control our experience. Based on craving, clinging arises. And clinging is an exploration of the object of our craving. So we have thoughts about it, why we like it, why we don't like it, uh, this or that, the beginning of conceptualization. Based on clinging, we have our habitual tendencies. And these are the library of uh, options and reactions we have in response to, to what we are experiencing. Um, based on habitual tendencies, we have birth, birth of action, and based on birth, we have death. Uh, we can say the ending of action. So that's the whole chain. And we can use this to, to think about an inter interaction. So uh, anger is a good one to think about. So you hear a sound with your ear, someone says something. Based on that, you're awake, your ear is working, the, the vibrations hit your ear, and, and then an ear feeling arises. It's painful. They said something you don't like. Based on that painful feeling, you don't like it. And based on that not like, you start thinking about it. Why did they say that? They're wrong. How dare they? And so on. And this is the beginning of an emotional reaction. With that emotion, then we have options. What do we do with an emotion? We say something back to them. We pick a fight. We internalize it, go home and kick the cat. Hopefully not. Go home, get an ulcer, that's bad too. Go home and stew about it for a week and then cut someone off in traffic and honk and yep, that can happen too. Then that action happens and then it is done. That's the end of the chain. And so we can think about this as a buildup of energy towards, uh, towards an action when emotions are involved. This happens automatically. 
if we think about the ear and so on scientifically, it, it kind of can, that analogy can clarify. Because we know, we, we know, in air quotes, the ear, when it senses vibration, it creates an impulse to the brain, which creates an image, right? And that happens automatically. That image is, uh, we have nothing to do with it. There's a working ear, there's vibration, there's sound, and automatically that happens. So we have no question how that happens. The rest of the steps have that kind of causality associated with them. They will just run through the chain until we recognize that's happening. And this is an issue because uh, when things happen we do not like, we have limited options. We're left with our pattern of habitual tendencies to choose from and not really a lot of awareness of what we're doing with them. So this is a psychological view of the process. Craving is the moment when we start identifying with this process. And as we've been talking about, craving can be easily identified as tension and tightness. And we are learning how craving can be let go with a 6R with the relax. When we relax, the craving uh, goes away. Mind is open and clear without craving. And at that moment, the chain of dependent origination stops. So this is a chain of conditionality. With the condition of feeling, craving will arise. Just like with the condition of a working ear, you produce an image. With Feeling as condition, craving arises. With craving as condition, clinging, thinking, examining, exploring the object of your craving. So, if we can let go of craving, then the conditions for clinging no longer exist, and clinging no longer happens. And so this is the idea. When we can notice this happening, and we can 6R and relax, we can stop this process and we can stop the emotional energetic buildup. When there is no attachment, when there is no involvement, things can dissipate as they naturally do. And when our attachment no, no longer holds it into place, that anger can be seen as it is, can be let go of, and we can replace it with a response we choose, which will hopefully not be kicking the cat more choosing words appropriately and taking appropriate responses. Yeah. And so when we can examine this in our daily life, uh, we have more options. We will get less caught and we will re remain mindful. So noticing each of the steps uh, and learning about them will help you identify, as them, to identify them as they're happening. And so you can uh, have choice like that. So, thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Zavati in Jetta's Grove and at the Ambedikas Park. There the Venerable Sariputta addressed the monks thus, friends, monks, friend, they replied. The Venerable Sariputta said this, one of right view, one of right view, it is said, friends. In what way is a noble disciple one of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at this true Dhamma? Indeed, friend, we would come from far away to learn from the Venerable Sariputta the meaning of the statement. It would be good if the Venerable Sariputta would explain the meaning of the statement. Having heard from him, the monks will remember it. Then, friends, listen closely, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the monks replied. The venerable Sariputta said this. The wholesome and the unwholesome. When, friends, a noble disciple understands the wholesome, uh, craving, taking things personally, and the root of the unwholesome, the wholesome and the root of the wholesome, in that way he is one of right view whose view is straight, 
who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at the true, his true Dhamma? And what, friends, is the unwholesome? What is the root of the unwholesome? What is the wholesome? What is the root of the wholesome? Killing living beings is unwholesome. Taking what is not given is unwholesome. Misconduct and sense pleasures is unwholesome. False speech is unwholesome. Malicious speech is unwholesome. Harsh speech is unwholesome. Gossip is unwholesome. Covetedness is unwholesome. Ill will is unwholesome. Wrong view is unwholesome. This is called the unwholesome. And what is the root of the unwholesome? Greed is a root of the unwholesome. Hate is a root of the unwholesome. Delusion is a root of the unwholesome. This is called the root of the unwholesome. And what is the wholesome? Abstention from killing living beings is wholesome. Abstention from taking what is not given is wholesome. Abstention from misconduct and sensual pleasures is unwholesome. Abstention from false speech is wholesome. Abstention from malicious speech is wholesome. Abstention from harsh speech is wholesome. Abstention from gossip is wholesome. Uncovetedness is wholesome. Non-ill will is wholesome. Right view is wholesome. This is called the wholesome. So we have the 10 courses of positive and negative conduct. And what is the root of the wholesome? Non-greed is the root of the wholesome. Non-hate is the root of the wholesome. Non-delusion is the root of the wholesome. This is called the root of the wholesome. When a noble disciple has thus understood the unwholesome and the root of the unwholesome, the wholesome and the root of the wholesome, he entirely abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abol uh, abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit, I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing to true knowledge here and now makes an end to suffering. In this way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view. His view is straight and has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at the true Dhamma. Nutriment. Saying, good friend, monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they asked him a further question. But friend, might be there another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived in this true Dhamma? There might be friends. When friends, a noble disciple understands nutriment, the origin of nutriment, the cessation of nutriment, and the way leading to the cessation of nutriment. In that way, he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what is nutriment? What is the origin of nutriment? And what is the cessation of nutriment? And what is the way leading to the cessation of nutriment? We're talking in the context of the Four Noble Truths here. There are four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the maintenance of beings uh, and for the support of those about to come to be. What for? They are physical food as nutriment, gross and subtle, contact as the second, mental volition, and consciousness as the fourth. With the arising of craving, there is a rising of nutriment. With hunger and craving for food, we eat. With craving for contact, we perceive. With craving for volition and consciousness, we continue on. With the cessation of craving, there is a cessation of nutriment. The way leading to the cessation of nutriment is just this able no noble eightfold path. Though with the cessation of craving, we will still eat food. That is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. When a noble disciple has thus understood nutriment, the origin of nutriment, the cessation of nutriment, and the way leading to the cessation of nutriment, he entirely abandons the underlying tendency to greed. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit, I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge here and now, makes an end of suffering. In that way too, a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has an unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at this true Dhamma. It's interesting that each of these uh, sections is listed as uh, a qualification for right view entirely. 
and truly understanding any one of these aspects and saying is will lead to right view. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they asked him a further question, but friend, there might be another way in which the no noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived in the true Dhamma. There might be friends. When a noble disciple understands suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the way leading to the cessation of suffering, in that way he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. What is suffering? What is the origin of suffering? And what is the cessation of suffering? What is the way leading to the cessation of suffering? Birth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Sickness is suffering. Death is suffering. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are suffering. Not to obtain what one wants is suffering. In short, the five aggregates affected by clinging are suffering. This is called suffering. And what is the origin of suffering? It is craving, which brings renewal of being, is accompanied by delight and lust, and delights in this or that. That is craving for sensual pleasures, craving for being, craving for non-being. This is called the origin of suffering. And, and what is the cessation of suffering? It is the remainderless fading away and ceasing, the giving up, relinquishing, letting go, and rejecting of that same craving. This is called the cessation of suffering. And what is the way leading to the cessation of suffering? It is just this noble eightfold path. And if you noticed craving what was, what was driving the, the taints, the craving for being, craving for non-being, craving for sensual pleasures. And in fact, craving is the connector for every step in dependent origination. Um, letting go of craving at any step will will break the chain there. And what is the way leading to the cessation of suffering? It is just this noble eightfold path. And when the noble disciple understands the suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, he, he the way, he entirely abandons the underlying tendency for lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit, I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end to suffering. In this way too, a noble disciple is one of right view. His view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And so now we'll be going over the 12 step dependent origination. It's, it's interesting. I, I like to remember that this has been chanted for over 2,500 years. And these steps and words have been preserved in this form for reasons. Um, and so when we're learning this, we're, we're learning something that many before have learned and qu found quite useful in the same way. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they asked him a further question, but friend, might there be another way in which the noble disciple is of right view, has arrived at this true Dhamma? There might be friends. When friends, a noble disciple understands aging and death, the origin of aging and death, the cessation of aging and death, and the way leading to the cessation of aging and death, in that way is one of right view and has arrived at the true Dhamma. And what is aging and death? What is the origin of aging and death? And what is the cessation of aging and death? What is the way leading to the cessation of aging and death? The aging of beings in various orders of beings, their old age, brokenness of teeth, grayness of hair, wrinkling of skin, decline of life, weakness of faculties. This is called aging. The passing of beings of the various orders of beings, their passing away, dissolution, disappearance, dying, completion of time, dilution, dis dissolution of the aggregates, laying down of the body. This is called death. So this aging and this death are what are called aging and death. With the arising of birth, there is a rising of aging and death. With the cessation of birth, there is a cessation of aging and death. The way leading to the cessation of aging and death is just the noble eightfold path. 
What a noble disciple has thus understood aging and death, the origin of aging and death, the cessation of aging and death, and the way leading to the cessation of aging and death. He abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end to suffering. In this way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view. His view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, has arrived at this true Dhamma. So, uh, aging and death can be talked about specifically as aging and death. And that is also uh, talked about as uh, a cause of suffering from the first noble truth. But it also be, can be thought of as the uh, on several, several other time frames as well, both the arising and passing away of moment by moment experience, the arising of this uh, solution up and down, and of course the results of our actions, um, which frequently can be causes of suffering themselves. So we can we can uh, think of this as in multiple time frames as we go through. Birth, uh, birth, uh, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. They asked him a further question, but friends, might there be another way in which the noble disciple is of right view, and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There might be friends. When friends, a noble disciple understands birth, the origin of birth, the cessation of birth, and the way leading to the cessation of birth. In that way, he is one of right view and has arrived at the true Dhamma. And what is birth? What is the origin of birth? And what is the cessation of birth? And what is the way leading to the cessation of birth? The birth of beings in the various orders of beings, their coming to birth, precipitation in a womb, generation, manifestation of the aggregates, obtaining the basis for contact. This is called birth. With the arising of being, or with the rising of habitual tendencies, there is a rising of birth. With the cessation of habitual tendencies, there is a cessation of birth. The way leading to the cessation of birth is just this noble eightfold path. When a noble disciple has just uh, thus understood birth, the origin of birth, the cessation of birth, and the way leading to the cessation of birth, he abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end to suffering. In this way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view. His view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived in this true Dhamma. Birth can be thought of as action, action that is verbal, mental or physical, so deed, speech, and thoughts. Habitual tendencies. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. They asked him a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There might be friends. When friends, a noble disciple understands habitual tendencies, the origin of habitual tendencies, the cessation of habitual tendencies, and the way leading to the cessation of the habitual tendencies. In that way, he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what is habitual tendencies? And what is the origin of habitual tendencies? And what is the cessation of habitual tendencies? And what is the way leading to the cessation of habitual tendencies? There are these three kinds of habitual tendencies. Sense fear habitual tendencies, find material habitual tendencies, and immaterial habitual tendencies. With the arising of clinging, there is a rising of habitual tendencies. With the cessation of clinging, there is a cessation of habitual tendencies. The way leading to the cessation of habitual tendencies is just this noble eightfold path. That is, when a noble disciple has thus understood habitual tendencies, the origin of habitual tendencies, the cessation of habitual tendencies, and the way leading to the cessation of habitual tendencies, he entirely abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He, he abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. 
He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit I am, and by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end to suffering. In this way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at this true Dhamma. So, talking about the three kinds of habitual tendencies, the sense fear, the material, fine material, and the immaterial, um, talking about a couple of things here. So these refer to three spheres of existence and types of uh, being. So we are, as human beings, are in sense sphere existence. Um, so we can say there are roughly six planes of sense sphere existence. Um, a plane of God or Devas, of uh, jealous gods, titans, human beings, animals, hungry ghosts, and hell beings. We all share the same basic kind of physicality and makeup like that. Um, same kind of uh, kama, fine material being. Um, this is the Brahma Lokas, uh, different kind of uh, basis. This is associated with the first four jhanas, beings there uh, exist on uh, bliss and concentration, uh, though have bodies. And then uh, immaterial being is the immaterial realms, where there's just mind and no physical interaction. And again, very blissful states of being. So when we talk about kama leading to these states, uh, we can talk about uh, kama is intention, volition, and we go directly to meditation practice. So spending time in and gaining uh, confidence in the, the jhanas leads to kama leading to rebirth in the fine material and immaterial uh, realms. The first four jhanas lead to material realms when they're well mastered, and the uh, infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothing, and neither perception to the immaterial realms. This points to our habitual tendencies are plastic, and we can change our habitual tendencies with our actions, thoughts, and uh, speech. So, if we can change our kama and our course through meditation, we can change our responses uh, in any given moment. And so this is um, what we think and ponder upon. This is the inclination of our mind. And what we tend to do and how we tend to respond to something now means we're more likely to do that in the future uh, when we find ourselves not mindful and drawing randomly from our library, library of habitual tendencies. It would be good if most of the books we drew from the library were, were good books, right? We can choose how we add to our habitual tendencies and reinforce our habitual tendencies when we're mindful. And you can choose this in your meditation practice as well. How do you interact with the hindrance? How do you interact with pain? How do you interact with pleasure, pleasurable distraction? How you do that now is going to affect how you do that in the future. So hindrances uh, truly are opportunities. And as you work with them more, you see when you work with them skillfully, what happens is very really positive outcomes. So you're sitting in meditation and you have dullness arise and you uh, first get a little little looser with your uh, attention on your object and a little thought arises then another little thought and then before you know it you're dreaming and your head is bobbing and you come back right like that and if it's early in the morning maybe that's persistent or if it's right after lunch maybe that's persistent or maybe you're lucky and you're going through a period where sloth and torpor is just really trying to show you how it works and it will do that for a while until you, until you figure it out. No problem. So instead of going to sleep, we um, bring more attention to the present moment. We six R, relax, and come back. 
And then we sharpen up our mindfulness so we can see earlier in the process how to respond to that. We know the steps of the process, at least we're getting more familiar with it. And the more we understand the steps of the process, the sooner we can uh, 6R and come back and not be dreaming, even if it was a nice dream. So when we do that over and over again, we see that when the hindrance goes away, what is on the other side of the hindrance is a calm, collected mind. And so the hindrance is not a problem. This arguably clearly negative thing, we don't want it, right? We want to be clear with our object of meditation, having a great session, shows up. But when we let it be there and not fight with it and work with it, we find positive outcomes happen. And we put that in our bank of habitual tendencies, that this is not an emergency, that this is not a problem. Not only does this inform our practice, the next time a hindrance comes in, the next time we have to deal with another hindrance, we know it's not a problem, it's an opportunity. And if we just work with it and wait it out, let it be there and do the work with it, on the other side will be something very interesting. That we learn. And then we're faced with negative uh, sensation, negative clinging, negative situations in our daily life maybe we remember, oh, we can let that be there too. We don't have to react to that. We don't have to take that personally. We can relax and open and be there with that. And from there we open up and have opportunity to respond as we would like to remember ourselves responding like that. So in that way we can fulfill our habitual tendencies with uh, good options. Someone once told me it's kind of like one of those uh, lottery balls systems with different color balls in it. We have black and white balls. And when we, when we lose control and we have to draw on the habitual tendencies, a black or a white ball is going to come up. We don't really get a choice, actually. If we did, we'd pick the white ball. So to, what you want to do is you want to put a lot of white balls in there. So when the time comes, that's what's going to come up. And that's what we do every time we 6R. And this can happen all the time. If you remain mindful all the time, walking to your cootie, going to eat, all of these mind moments, all of these memories and thoughts, you can work with them the same way. And this will lead to a continuation of collectedness, a continuation of mindfulness. And um, yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a good outcome. So every moment's an opportunity. Clinging. Saying, good friend. Good friend. The monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they asked them a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at the true Dhamma? There might be friends. When friends, a noble disciple understands clinging, the origin of clinging, the cessation of clinging, and the way leading to the cessation of clinging, in that way he is one of right view and has arrived at the true Dhamma. In what is clinging, what is the origin of clinging, and what is the cessation of clinging, what is the way leading to the cessation of clinging? There are these four kinds of clinging. Clinging to sense pleasures, clinging to views, clinging to rules and observances, and clinging to a doctrine of self. So clinging to views is simply to clinging to thoughts, concepts, and ideas, and thinking they are real and what is happening. Clinging to a doctrine of self is the various views and doctrines of self, which ultimately lead to confusion about what is happening. With the arising of craving, there is the arising of clinging. With the cessation of craving, there is the cessation of clinging. The way leading to the cessation of clinging is just this noble eightfold path. That is right view, right effort, right mindfulness. Um. <clears throat> 
that is uh, <laughs> right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. The noble disciple is thus understood clinging, the origin of clinging, the cessation of clinging, and the way leading to the cessation of clinging. He entirely abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He embellishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and there, here and now makes an end to suffering. In that way too, a noble disciple is one of right view. His view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at the true Dhamma. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. They asked him a further question. But friend, is there another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There might be friends. When friends and noble disciple understands craving, the origin of craving, the cessation of craving, and the way leading to the cessation of craving, in that way he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what is craving? What is the origin of craving? What is the cessation of craving? What is the way leading to the cessation of craving? There are these six classes of craving, craving for forms, craving for sounds, craving for odors, craving for flavors, craving for tangibles, craving for mind objects. With the cessation of feeling, with the arising of feeling, there is the arising of craving. With the cessation of feeling, there is the cessation of craving. The way leading to the cessation of craving is just this noble eightfold path. When a noble disciple has thus understood craving, the origin of craving, the cessation of craving, in the way leading to the cessation of craving. He entirely un abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He expirates, expirates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end to suffering. In that way too, a noble disciple is one of right view. His view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, has arrived at this true Dhamma. And there is, of course, a lot to say about craving. And it's something we talk about all the time because it is the key to unlocking uh, the meditation process. When we can identify craving, we, when we let go of it, it will break uh, the chain of dependent origination. This is truly the weak link. And actually, removing craving and relaxing, bringing us to a clear mind is the key to understanding a lot of the Dhamma. So when in doubt, relax and enter clear mind and view the situation with that. Craving is not the beginning of our emotional reaction. Uh, it is the beginning of liking and disliking which triggers our emotional reaction. Clinging and our concepts and proliferation are where that process starts. Um, as we build up clinging and thoughts about something, we get pu pulled further and further away from what is happening. And we find ourselves in a world of ideas that don't even point to the direct reality anymore of what's happening. Um, craving is the start of that process. Um, clinging, it becomes uh, stronger, the thoughts and concepts become bigger until we find ourselves having to do something about it. Whether or not it's what's actually happening or if it's our idea of what we imagine is happening. Like that. Feeling. Saying, good friend, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they asked him a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which the noble discipline disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There might be friends. When friends, a noble disciple understands feeling, the origin of feeling, the cessation of feeling, and the way leading to the cessation of feeling. In that way, he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what is feeling, what is the origin of feeling, and what is the cessation of feeling? 
what is the way leading to the cessation of feeling. There are these six classes of feeling, feeling born of eye contact, feeling born of ear contact, feeling born of nose contact, feeling born of tongue contact, feeling born of body contact, feeling born of mind contact. With the arising of contact, there is a arising of feeling. With the cessation of contact, there is a cessation of feeling. The way leading to the cessation of feeling is just this noble, noble eightfold path. When a noble disciple has just un thus understood feeling, the origin of feeling, the cessation of feeling, and the way leading to the cessation of feeling, he entirely, un he entirely abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end to suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, was unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Contact. Saying, good friend, good friend. The monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. They then asked him a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There might be friends. When friends and noble disciple understands contact, the origin of contact, the cessation of contact, and the way leading to the cessation of contact, in that way he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what is contact? What is the origin of contact? And what is the cessation of contact? And what is the way leading to the cessation of contact? There are these six classes of contact, eye contact, ear contact, nose contact, tongue contact, body contact, mind contact. With the arising of the sixfold base, there is an arising of contact. With the cessation of the sixfold base, there is a cessation of contact. The way leading to the cessation of contact is just this noble eightfold path that is right view. That is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right, right mindfulness, and right concentration. When a noble disciple has thus understood contact, the origin of contact, the cessation of contact, and the way leading to the cessation of contact, he entirely abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He expertates the underlying tendency of the view and conceit I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end to suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view, whose right view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at this true Dhamma. So as we talked about, contact is simply when I meets, uh, when a working eye meets a form, so light meets an eye, and consciousness is present. Uh, with this condition, uh, this eye feeling arises. An eye feeling being pleasant, painful, neither pleasant nor painful, has no suffering in it. It is just feeling. Uh, unless we catch it, craving uh, will, will arise, eye craving will arise. And if it's a painful feeling, we will not like it. If it's a pleasant feeling, we will like it. That is when our opinion and suffering begins, it is with craving. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the Venerable Sariputta's words. They then asked them a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There might be friends. When friends a noble disciple understands the sixfold base, the origin of the sixfold base, the cessation of the sixfold base, and the way leading to the cessation of the sixfold base, in that way, he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what is the sixfold base? What is the origin of the sixfold base? And what is the cessation of the sixfold base? What is the way leading to the cessation of the sixfold base? There are those six bases the eye base, the ear base, the nose base, the tongue base, the body base, the mind base. 
With the arising of mentality and materiality, there is the arising of the sixfold phase. With the cessation of mentality and materiality, there is the cessation of the sixfold phase. The way leading to the cessation of the sixfold phase is just this noble eightfold path. That is, right view, <clears throat> right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. When a noble disciple has thus understood the sixfold base, the origin of the sixfold base, the cessation of the sixfold base, and the way leading to the cessation of the sixfold base, he here and now makes an end to suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view, it has arrived at this true Dhamma. The sixfold base is not uh, directly experienced. We don't uh, perceive our eye and then perceive our eye perceiving um, like that, but it is a necessary condition for the arising of contact to have working eye. And when it, eye is not present, uh, we have no conditions for the a possibility of eye contact, which is why it is there. <laughs> Mentality, materiality. So, good friend, good, so good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they asked him a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There might be friends. When friends, a noble disciple understood mentality, materiality, the origin of mentality, materiality, the cessation of mentality, materiality, and the way leading to the cessation of mentality, materiality. In that way, he is a, one of right view and has arrived at the true Dhamma. And what is mentality, materiality? What is the origin of mentality, materiality? What is the cessation of mentality, materiality? What is the way leading to the cessation of mentality, materiality? Feeling, perception, volition, contact, and attention. These are called mentality. The four great elements in the material form derived from, them, from the four great elements. These are called materiality. With the arising of consciousness, there is the arising of mentality, materiality. With the cessation of consciousness, there is a cessation of mentality, materiality. The way leading to the cessation of mentality, materiality is just this noble eightfold path. When a noble disciple has thus understood mentality, materiality, the origin of mentality, materiality, the cessation of mentality, materiality, and the way leading to the cessation of mentality, materiality, he entirely abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He ab abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end to suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view. His view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma. So mentality, materiality, um, as another way of saying this body-mind complex, uh, that's another, um, with the, and it's also can be thought of as kind of a raw, raw perception, just color, just touch, just form without any kind of processing around it. Uh, this, uh, precedes contact and it can be perceived the mind that is very clear and in some ways is very straightforward, but usually contact and processing will happen, happen first. And so mentality, materiality has consciousness as condition for uh, when there is no consciousness present, our bodies do not continue. Even though consciousness is a, is a potentiality at this place. So we have the four elements and the four uh, and the faculties that can perceive them uh, leading to it. that's mentality materiality consciousness saying good friend the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words then they asked them a further question but friend might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true dhamma there might be friends 
When, friends, a noble disciple understands consciousness, the origin of consciousness, the cessation of consciousness, and the way leading to the cessation of consciousness, in that way he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what is consciousness? What is the origin of consciousness? And what is the cessation of consciousness? What is the way leading to the cessation of consciousness? There are six classes of consciousness, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, mind consciousness. With the arising of formations, there is a rising of consciousness. With the cessation of formations, there is a cessation of consciousness. The way leading to the cessation of consciousness is just this noble eightfold path. That is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. When a noble disciple has thus understood consciousness, the origin of consciousness, the cessation of consciousness, and the way leading to the cessation of consciousness, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way too, a noble disciple is one of right view and has made and has arrived at this true Dhamma. So consciousness here shows up in a couple places in the chain. And this can be confusing when you're thinking of it in a linear way. So just pointing out when we have it in this part of the chain, this is uh, a way uh, Nama Rupa activates. And, and so the way the, facu the faculties can observe uh, and process the, the four elements. And ultimately this is simply tongue consciousness. So it comes into play in contact, even though we have it here as an activator and uh, support for mentality materiality. There are several places in dependent origination where things get a little loopy and self-referential and the linear model starts to break down if you're thinking about it too hard. Um, and that is interesting to explore and not necessary to understand to use this model. Um, effectively, because we're using this to understand how our cognition works and how to identify uh, getting distraction and how to use it in our meditation object better. For if we understand feeling, we can notice it at early on in the distraction process, or we can notice the feeling associated with drowsiness. Let go of that before we start identifying. We can notice feeling coming up and let go. Eventually, we can see contact come up and go. Uh, and, and as we see these things clearer and clearer, we can stay more and more with our meditation object and might let mind get more and more collected. Formations. Saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they asked them a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There might be friends. When friends, a noble disciple understands formations, the origin of formations, the cessation of formations, and the way leading to the cessation of formations, in that way he is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. In what are formations? What is the origin of formations? What is the cessation of formations? What is the way leading to the cessation of formations? There is these three kind of formations, the bodily formation, the verbal formation, the mental formation. With the arising of ignorance, there is a rising of formations. With the cessation of ignorance, there is a cessation of formations. The way leading to the cessation of formations is just this noble eightfold path. When a noble disciple has thus understood formations, the origin of formations, the cessation of formations, and the way leading to the cessation of formations, he entirely unabandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Ignorance, saying, good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. 
Then they asked him a further question. But friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma? There might be friends. When friends, a noble disciple understands ignorance, the origin of ignorance, the cessation of ignorance, and the way leading to the cessation of ignorance. In that way is one of right view and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what is ignorance? What is the origin of ignorance? What is the cessation of ignorance? What is the way leading to the cessation of ignorance? Not knowing about suffering, not knowing about the origin of suffering, not knowing about the cessation of suffering, not knowing about the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This is called ignorance. With the arising of the, of the taints, there is the arising of ignorance. With the cessation of the taints, there is the cessation of ignorance. This is the way leading to the cessation of ignorance. The way leading to the cessation of ignorance is just this able, noble eightfold path. When a noble disciple has thus understood ignorance, the origin of ignorance, the cessation of ignorance, and the way leading to the cessation of ignorance, he entirely under, abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit, I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end to suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view. His view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Taints. Saying, Good friend, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then they asked him a further question Might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view? whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at this true Dhamma. There might be friends. When friends, a noble disciple understands the taints, the origin of the taints, the cessation of the taints, the way leading to the cessation of the taints, in that way is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at the true Dhamma. And what are the taints? What is the origin of the taints? And what is the cessation of the taints? What is the way leading to the cessation of the taints? These are, there are these three taints, the taint of sensual desire, the taint of being, the taint of ignorance. With the arising of ignorance, there is the arising of the taints. With the cessation of ignorance, there is the cessation of the taints. The way leading to the cessation of the taints is just this noble eightfold path. That is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right mindfulness, and right concentration. When a noble disciple has thus understood the taints, the origin of the taints, the cessation of the taints, and the way leading to the cessation of the taints, he entirely un un abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit I am, and by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end to suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, whose unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, and has arrived at this true Dhamma. So you may have noticed there's some circular reasoning there where the, the taints, uh, the, the cause of the taints is ignorance, and the cause of the ignorance is the taints. Um, if you think in ignorance is forgetting the Four Noble Truths and forgetting to be mindful and forgetting to be uh, alert, that makes room for the taints. And the taints can be thought of as distractions that pull mind away from mindfulness and therefore uh, allow ignorance and cause ignorance like that. So they reinforce each other. It's a circular uh, Circular relation, relationship, but it's really about loss of mindfulness or ability to lose mindfulness. That is what the Venerable Sariputta said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Venerable Sariputta's words. So um, that is the 12 link um, representation of dependent origination. It's uh, frequently experienced going forwards, and it's important to train it going backwards because we are learning how to let go of each link. Um, 
like that. It can be noticed in your meditation and it is uh, a process we talk about, the process of distraction all the time. As you become familiar with each of the steps, you can learn to identify them and let go right there. Craving is the key to unlocking this chain. Craving will stop a link at anywhere in the chain. <coughs> Craving, <laughs> painful ear feeling arises. <laughs> like, yeah. So when you can relax and be present, you can break the chain right there. Any questions? Let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free in the fear-struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief. May all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu. Thank you.